study yesterday in Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 5. And we were thinking about the exhortation that Isaiah gave to the people of his day. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. And we made the point that the nation, knowing God's promises as we do, should have been walking then in the reflected light of that future day that day of the kingdom that Isaiah speaks about at the beginning of the second chapter. And we too have to be walking as children of light. Jesus, remember, said to his disciples, ye are the light of the world. The light of God's truth ought to be radiating also from us in our lives in the truth. And it is just worth extending this thought a little further. And I'd like you to come with me to Paul's epistle to the Ephesians and chapter 5, where he has something to say about light and darkness. Ephesians and chapter 5. Verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And he's not saying you were sometime in darkness. He says you were darkness. You were darkness, he says. And it's explained, as I've noted on the screen there, back in chapter 4, verse 18. As Gentiles, they were darkened in their understanding. But now, Paul says, they were light in the Lord, and they had a duty as disciples to walk as children of light. And then he expands on this. If you just look a little bit, little bit further on in chapter 5 and verse 15. See then, he says, that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, for the days are evil. We have to take care how we walk. And he says we have to redeem the time. Well, the days in which Paul was writing certainly were evil. The days in which Isaiah prophesied were evil. And of course it's true also of our own time. So we have to redeem the time. And if you've got a margin in your Bible, it may tell you that the Greek literally there for redeeming the time is buying up the opportunity. It's the idea of a marketplace. And if we're alert shoppers, as we pass through the marketplace, we don't miss the opportunity to buy up what we need. And that is also true in a spiritual sense. As we go through the marketplace of life, we too have to buy up, as it were, every opportunity to serve our Father in heaven, to put the knowledge of his will that we have into practice in our lives. And as with any marketplace, you have to pay a price. And the price for putting God's will into practice in our lives is nothing less than the sacrifice of our own self-indulgence. But as I put on the second bullet point there on the screen, there is another thought running through these words because redeeming the time or buying up the opportunity is an echo of an earlier scripture one that we all know very well actually Daniel chapter 2 that remarkable vision that Nebuchadnezzar had when he went to bed one night wondering what was going to happen to his empire after he was dead and God revealed the secret to him and as we know he called his wise men before him and demanded that they told him what he'd seen in the dream and the interpretation, or else he said they would be put to death. Humanly speaking, an impossible task. But he knew what his wise men were like. He knew that if he told them the dream, they could make up any interpretation, and he wanted to know the truth. And in Daniel chapter 2, verse 8, he says to them, I know that you would gain, or as the margin has it, by the time. And that's 
the expression that Paul is echoing here, writing to the Ephesians. I know that you would buy the time. Now, those men who stood before Nebuchadnezzar that morning knew the danger they were in. And the question is, is their sense of danger ours? Because when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, as I've indicated there on the screen, there may be very many people who would feel they would give everything to secure another period of opportunity. But by then it will be too late. Life itself will be forfeit. Hence the urgency of the Apostle's warning here. We have to see that we walk circumspectly now, not as fools, but as wise servants, redeeming the time. Well, let's come back to Isaiah chapter 2. Despite the coming of glory for Judah and Jerusalem in the latter days, God hath forsaken his people for a time, for reasons that are set out in the next few verses, verses 6 to 9. And here we find that the people are denounced. Let's have a look then at verse 6. Therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob. Why? Why had God forsaken his people? Because, says Isaiah, they be replenished from the east, and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. And the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself. So that's what was wrong with the people. God had forsaken the people because, says verse 6, and then we have a whole list of reasons. And the conclusion that flows from this is at the end of verse 9. Therefore, says the prophet, forgive them not. See, these people had chosen to walk in darkness, not light. They were no longer conforming to God's law, but instead they were putting their trust in man. Consequently, the land was full of silver and gold. Prosperity had turned the people away from God. And that's certainly something we need to think about in our days, isn't it? Prosperity had turned the people away from God, and they turned over to the worship of idols. As Isaiah says, the work of their own hands. That which their own fingers have made. Fancy worshipping that. And Isaiah then is just pointing up here the sheer folly of what they were doing. Now these are problems that can affect us today, aren't they, brethren and sisters? And we need to beware. What about this matter of idol worship? Well, the problem of idolatry is still with us, isn't it? Remember those words that Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He said, Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. Now all these things happen to them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. So idolatry is something that disciples of Christ need to think about. It reflects an attitude of mind actually, that is common in human nature. It's a preoccupation with the products of human thinking and human handiwork. Idols, and we can make idols out of all sorts of things in our lives, prevent us from giving our wholehearted attention to the things of God. Now, the Bible has a lot to say on the subject of idolatry, but perhaps for us there are two particular passages that are worth thinking about in this connection. Just come on to Colossians and chapter 3. Paul's epistle to the Colossians and the third chapter. Verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, 
which is idolatry. So there the Apostle Paul identifies covetousness as a form of idolatry. Now, covetousness is a, a desire or greed for gain, for self-gratification. So if in our lives we become preoccupied with acquiring what Scripture calls the unrighteous mammon, it's going to consume all our physical and our mental energies. And the truth is just going to get pushed to the back of our minds. And Jesus reminds us emphatically that we cannot serve two masters. Divided allegiance is not acceptable to God. And covetousness is a form of idolatry. But if we think we're perhaps safe from that one, what about this next reference? Back to the Old Testament, 1st of Samuel chapter 15, And verse 22. Now this takes us back to the matter of Saul and the Amalekites, where you remember Saul disobeyed God's command, and he is rebuked in this chapter by Samuel. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 22, we have this. Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness, stubbornness, he says, is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Now there's a sweeping statement, isn't there? Stubbornness is a form of of idolatry and that's as true today as it was in the past so if in the language of these verses we refuse to hearken unto God and to obey him but rather we allow our own desires to take priority then it is self with a capital S that has become our idol stubbornness is a form of idolatry so all of us, brethren and sisters, need to examine very carefully our own lives, searching for any idols that might be lurking there. And where we find them, we have to cut them down, grind them to powder, and dedicate ourselves entirely to the service of our God. But you remember another problem that Isaiah identified in those verses we read in chapter 2 was the problem of wealth. The people had allowed their prosperity to turn them away from God. And we live in an age when that danger is ever-present. We live in a society that worships materialism. And there are obvious dangers for us in that, especially bearing in mind what we've just said about the problem of idolatry. Now, the scriptures actually have a good deal to say about the problem of wealth, or the potential problem of wealth. Just come to Paul's first letter to Timothy. First of Timothy and chapter 6. And we want to go in at verse 7. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 7. Where Paul writes, we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich, those who desire to be rich, fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So, says Paul, we, we all have to, be, have to learn to be content with the necessities of life. But, you know, this passage, particularly those words in verse 10, which are, have become something of a motto, those words are often misquoted, aren't they? Money is the root of all evil. Well, that isn't what Paul says. He says it's the love of money that is the root of of all evil. He's not condemning wealth in itself, nor is Isaiah indeed, back in that second chapter of his prophecy. 
And as we look through Scripture, we find that actually there were some great men of faith who were so blessed by God that they became very rich men. And perhaps Abraham is the most obvious example of that. He had a very large household, didn't he? We know in Genesis chapter 14 that he was able to muster 318 fighting men from his household to go and rescue Lot, which means his household must have numbered at least a thousand, if not more. Now, God had said to him back in chapter 12, I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great. And yes, indeed, in its fullness, the realization of that promise is going to be seen in the kingdom. But there was an incipient fulfillment of it in Abraham's lifetime. And we know that because of the language that's used in Genesis chapter 24, a chapter which begins by saying, the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. God said he would bless him, and he did bless him in his lifetime. And later on in that 24th chapter, uh, we read that when the steward arrived at Paden Aram, he says, the Lord hath blessed my master greatly, and he has become great. And he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. God actually blessed Abraham so that he became a very rich man. And God did that because of Abraham's faith. But Abraham was a man who was able to handle the blessing that God had given him. Or again, you might consider David. He accumulated an enormous amount of wealth and he saved it for the temple and he was able to say, all things come of thee and of thine own have we given thee. And that's surely the right attitude, isn't it, brethren and sisters? And the Spirit's teaching here in 1 Timothy 6 is perfectly in harmony with this. The Apostle in verse 9 is warning against the danger of desiring to be rich. In verse 10, loving money, of coveting after it. And in verse 17, of trusting in uncertain riches. That's what we have to guard against. Wealth today, of course, is far more widely spread than it was back in the first century or than it was in the days of Isaiah. Even than it was a hundred years ago. How many of us, for example, could honestly say that in our lives we've had the experience of Brother Robert Roberts? When he moved down from the north of England, he, he moved down to Birmingham to live with his wife, and he went to Birmingham for the sole purpose of uh, uh, finding an outlet to preach the truth. He had no job to begin with, though mercifully God provided him with one very soon. And Brother Roberts records in his autobiography, My Ways and My Days, that he attended a tea meeting in Birmingham with a group of other brethren and sisters. And in order to cover the cost, he had to put his last 18 pence in the collection. And it was his last 18 pence. It wasn't just loose change. And even Brother Roberts is moved to comment about the hardness of the way at that particular time in his life. But certainly in the developed world where we live, wealth is far more widely spread, isn't it, these days? And the danger for us, brethren and sisters, in the, in the words of one of Jesus' parables, is that we might be tempted to take our ease, to trust in the material things of this life instead of trusting in God. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 19, Paul exhorts the wealthy brethren to lay up in store for themselves a good foundation. Literally, it is to lay up as treasure for themselves, picking up the language of the Lord in Matthew chapter 6, a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. To know God and his way is to possess real and lasting treasure. And we have to make the following of that way our top priority in life. But just come back now to Isaiah chapter 2. Just thinking back to these words that we were looking at. Isaiah chapter 2 and verses 6 to 9. Brother Roberts actually in Ministry of the Prophets... You remember he wrote the first few chapters of that book and Brother C.C. Walker took over when Brother Roberts died. Brother Roberts actually wrote the chapter on Isaiah chapter 2 and he has this comment to make about verses 6 to 9. 
He says, here is the picture of a busy, active, energetic population finding pleasure in the things that please natural men and greatly interested in strangers who had no interest in God and conforming great and small to the religion that was fashionable in the surrounding countries. That the population so exhibited should have been a nation that God brought out of Egypt and organized for himself made it specially criminal. And so we could understand then the nature of Isaiah's condemnation. But I think it's helpful when we come to these words in Isaiah, particularly in these chapters 2 to 6, to see them against the historical background that applies during the reign of King Isaiah and the regency of Jotham. We said yesterday that chapters 2 to 6 historically belong to that period. So what I'd like to do now is just to come back to 2 Chronicles 26, just to pick up one or two of the details about Isaiah's reign, and then we'll go back to Isaiah and just see how um, the words are echoed there. So 2 Chronicles and chapter 26. When Isaiah began to reign in Judah, the kingdom was in a pretty poor state. His father Amaziah had turned away from God and had been severely beaten in the battle of Beth Shemesh by Joash, king of Israel. The north wall of Jerusalem had been broken down and the temple had been plundered. So that's the background and then we come to 2 Chronicles 26 and verses 1 to 4. Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the room of his father Amaziah. He built Eloth and restored it to Judah. After that, the king slept with his fathers. 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah did. So that's the introduction then that we're given to Uzziah. Now, Uzziah in 2 Kings is called Azariah. Uzziah means Yahweh is my strength, and Azariah means Yahweh has helped. And there's a difference of only one letter in the Hebrew between these two names. Yahweh is my strength, and Yahweh has helped. Now just bear that in mind and see what it says here in chapter 26, verse 15. The end of that verse, it says, Isaiah was marvelously helped till he was strong. God indeed helped this man, but he did not always rely on God for his strength. Now, when we come back to the beginning of chapter 26, we can see that his first recorded act was to reconquer the port of Eloth. That's in verse um, 2. He reconquered the port of Eloth, or Elath as it is in 2 Kings 14, which the Edomites had controlled for the last 80 years after their rebellion against Jehoram. This was situated on the northern end of the present-day Gulf of Aqaba, along with Ezi and Geba. Now, the reoccupation of this place would no doubt have led to a revival of shipping and trade. So that would have helped to bring wealth to Judah. So that's the first thing that we read about Isaiah. He reconquered this place. Now, when you just scan down a little bit further and you come to verses 4 and 5, we're told that he continued the religious reforms begun by his father. Then we find that with God's blessing, he experienced considerable military success. In verses 6 to 8 of this 26th chapter, we read that the Philistine cities were destroyed and Isaiah built new ones of his own. The Arabians living in the south around Beersheba also felt the strength of his rule. The Ammonites, we're told, gave gifts to Uzziah. His influence even extended as far as the borders of Egypt. Then you come down to verse 10, and you find that he developed the economy of the country by building towers in the desert, presumably watchtowers, to protect the flocks and the herds from attack. He dug wells, providing water for cattle, and he terraced the hills for vineyards. 
Archaeologists have apparently found traces of Judean farms equipped with cisterns, irrigation systems, and fortifications in the southern part of Judah, down in the Negev, which have been dated to the 8th century BC, the time of Uzziah. In addition to that, chapter 26 tells us that he had a large, well-organized, and well-equipped standing army. And he set about improving the defenses of his capital city, building three new towers, and putting on them, according to verse 15, engines invented by cunning men. And presumably they were powerful siege engines for firing arrows and catapulting stones. So when you just go through the details, we've got a picture here of a strong king who really strengthened his nation, both in economic and military terms. And he was faithful until, verse 15, his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And that verse is making it very clear to us that it was Isaiah's pride that brought about his fall. He wasn't content with the blessings, the many blessings he'd received, but he wanted more. Now, there have been many people in Scripture who've made this error. Just think about Korah and company in the wilderness. They were in that situation. Men who'd received tremendous blessings from God, but they wanted more. And they died for their presumption. And here we have another man. He'd had tremendous blessings from God, but he wasn't satisfied. We should always be satisfied with the blessings, the many blessings that we receive from our Heavenly Father. But this man wasn't. He went into the temple to usurp the authority of the high priest, to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And as we know, he was smitten with leprosy in the forehead. On the high priest's forehead were those words, holiness to the Lord. And it was that holiness that Isaiah had profaned. He'd made himself unclean. By his action. And as I put on the screen there, Josephus, recording Jewish tradition, claims that the earthquake in Isaiah's reign took place at this time. Now, the historical record of Scripture doesn't directly refer to the earthquake, it hints at it, but the prophets talk about it. Amos, for example, prophesied two years before the earthquake of Isaiah's reign. And Zechariah 14, of course, talks about another greater earthquake to take place, which will split the Mount of Olives in two. And people will flee to Zechariah as they fled in the days of Isaiah. So the earthquake happened, and Josephus says, a rent was made in the temple, and the bright rays of the sun shone through it, and fell upon the king's face, insomuch that the leprosy seized upon him immediately. And as the scripture record tells us, he was thrust out and remained a leper to the day of his death, living apart. Now, we don't know whether Isaiah eventually repented and found forgiveness before he died, but possibly he did. Because after all, the scripture verdict on King Isaiah is he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. That's the overall verdict that we're given about this king. So maybe he did repent and seek forgiveness before he died. But be that as it may, when we come back now to Isaiah and back to the second chapter, we can see this historical background reflected very clearly in the things that Isaiah has to say. Come back to chapter 2 and verse 7. Isaiah makes it clear that he's writing at a time when the nation is wealthy. These are the days of Isaiah. The land is full of silver and gold. Or again in chapter 3 from verse 16 onwards, the prophet speaks against the women of Judah who were parading their wealth and says that God was going to bring judgment. So it, it was a wealthy nation, just as we've seen in 2 Chronicles 26. As we've already seen in verse 8, Isaiah condemns them because of their idol worship. 
Now in 2 Kings 15, we read this about Uzziah. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done, save that the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burnt incense still on the high places. So there was idol worship there, and the same continued also in the reign of his son, Jotham. And Isaiah takes him to task over this. Then when you come down to verse 16, he speaks about ships of Tarshish. And that speaks about expanding trade. And it ties in, of course, with the record we have in Kings and Chronicles of Isaiah's taking of the port of Eloth on the Gulf of Aqaba. Trade and shipping expanded. And Isaiah also refers to the king's military preparations. Just have a look at verse 7 of chapter 2. Not only is the land full of silver and gold, not only is there no end of their treasures, but he says the land is full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Or again in verse 15, upon every high tower and upon every high wall, says Isaiah. Come now into chapter 3 and verse 2, where he refers to the mighty man and the man of war. So he's alluding to these military preparations, this trusting in human strength that was taking place during the reign of Isaiah. And of course, Isaiah refers quite extensively to what happened to King Isaiah, his fall. And so many references we get to that as we go through this section. Just come to verse 11. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled. That's what happened to Isaiah. He was greatly helped until he was strong. And then pride led to a fall. And he was typical of the nation. And Isaiah says in verse 11, The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, shall be brought low. The haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. Verse 12, the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty. He's referring, isn't he, to, to the king, the state of the king all the time. And the people would have known that. And he's drawing a lesson from that state that Isaiah was in. Verse 13, upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up. Verse 14, and upon all the high mountains and all the hills that are lifted up, and upon every high tower and every fenced wall, God was going to bring them all down. And then uh, there are other references as well as we go down, verse 17. And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low. Chapter 3 and verse 16. Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, just like the king, you know, they're haughty. They were going to be brought down. Or just finally in this section, come to chapter 5 and verse 15. The mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled, but the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Man is brought down just like King Uzziah had been, but God will always be exalted. Even this earthquake in Isaiah's reign is alluded to by Isaiah. Just stay in chapter 2 for a moment and just come back to verse 19. In fact, from verse 10 onwards, people are seen in Isaiah chapter 2 running to hide in caves and dens of the earth, even hiding in the tops of the mountains. They're looking for refuge, says Isaiah, from the judgment storm that is going to come. And then when we get down to verse 19, he says, They shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth, for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty, when he arises to shake terribly the earth. And they would know all about the earthquake, you know. It's an allusion, isn't it, to that earthquake that happened in Isaiah's time. And here, Isaiah is drawing a lesson from it. God is going to arise and shake terribly the earth. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, 
to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Because when you read through those verses, although of course there is an allusion to the earthquake in Isaiah's day, there are also clear hints, aren't there, of a greater earthquake here. The earthquake of Isaiah's day was only typical of a greater judgment to come. The judgment would come upon the nation, of course, first through the Assyrians, then through the Babylonians. It will also be fulfilled in a much greater sense at the time of the end. For when the day of the Lord comes, Zechariah 14 tells us, there's going to be another massive earthquake. It will split the Mount of Olives in two, and people will flee as they fled in the days of King Uzziah. There will be a judgment upon Israel and upon the Gentile nations. All the human things that men and women put their trust in will be of absolutely no avail in that day. The clefts of the rocks and the dens of the earth will provide no security. That can only be found in acknowledging and serving the God of Israel. And of course, this judgment is going to precede the state of blessing that Isaiah has spoken about in the early part of chapter 2. Anticipating this future time, God said through the prophet Haggai, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations. And you know, when the writer of Hebrews picks up and quotes those words of Haggai, in Hebrews chapter 12, he adds this comment. He says, Wherefore, we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, cannot be shaken, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. So yes, there is judgment to come, but the reassurance, says the writer there, is that we are to receive a kingdom by God's grace which cannot be shaken. So we put our trust in God and not in man. Verse 22 of Isaiah 2. Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? Man is mortal, but God lives forever. So that's why we put our trust in him. And then the theme continues, in fact, as we go into chapter 3, as the opening word for indicates it's a connecting word. The theme just carries on. And in chapter 3, verse 1, we read, For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. So in other words, Isaiah is saying that God who gave the nation its prosperity could easily, at his will, take it away. Verse 4, And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. Now, in one sense, those words came to pass quite soon after the prophecy was given. Ahaz was just 20 years old when he became king, Manasseh later was 12 when he ascended the throne, and both of those reigns were very troubled indeed. But in a wider sense, of course, Isaiah is indicating that calamity comes when rulers are children in their understanding. They lack the mature wisdom that can only be found in those whose lives are guided by the word of God. And the result of such immaturity, as Isaiah goes on to explain, would be oppression, pride, and injustice. Isaiah's leprous state was just like that of his people. Verse 8 of chapter 3 speaks about them provoking the eyes of God's glory. And that's exactly what Isaiah did when he blasphemously penetrated into the temple where the eyes, as it were, were to be found. In verse 12, the prophet laments, As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. And just a few verses later, that then leads him on 
to condemn the women of Judah, beginning in verse 16. Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go and making a tinkling with their feet, therefore the Lord will smite them. So he turns to the, to the, the daughters of Zion who paraded their wealth and says they're going to be smitten. But again, as you go through these verses, it's not the wealth in itself that is being condemned. It's the pride and ungodliness that went with it that the prophet is speaking against. Now, we can read these words from verse 16 onwards of chapter 3 simply as a condemnation of their pride, their ungodliness, their misuse of their wealth. And on one level, that's what it's speaking about. It fits in with the words of chapter 2. But I would suggest to you that there is also a deeper meaning in the prophet's words here. Because the daughters of Zion, here in this third chapter, are a figure of the nation, which is referred to many times as the daughter of Zion. So the daughters of Zion become a figure of the nation, the daughter of Zion. And if you just look at verse 18, you notice there he says, In that day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments. And as I put on the screen in the second bullet point there, the, the, the same word that's translated bravery is used in Exodus chapter 2 of Aaron's garments for glory and for beauty. It's the word beauty. It's a word associated with the priesthood. But it's not just the word bravery. If you come down to verse 22, he speaks there about the changeable suits of apparel. And that's the very expression that occurs in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 4, of the change of raiment of the high priest. Or again in verse 23, as the authorized version has it, he speaks about the hoods and the veils, the hoods. And that word hoods again is used in Zechariah 3 twice for the mitre placed on the high priest's head. So there's priestly language being used here. So the deeper meaning then, we would suggest to the prophet's words, is that as a kingdom of priests in the midst of the nations, Israel should have witnessed faithfully to God's word. Instead, they forsook him. And just as he said he would remove all the wealth and the finery from the women of Judah, so he would also take away the people's priestly office by scattering them among the nations. The calamity of war was going to come upon them. Verse 25 of the third chapter. Thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty in the war. And her gates shall lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. War was going to come upon them. And while the message of this section of Isaiah is indeed well expressed back in verse 11 as woe unto the wicked, as we said yesterday, the prophets also give hope. There's never just condemnation. There's always a message of hope, and there is here. If you have a look at chapter 3 and verse 10, the prophet says, Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. It's a lovely little verse, isn't it? In the midst of all this condemnation. In the midst of it all, God gives encouragement to the righteous man. He might have to share the evil day, but his reward is certain. So let us, when we read these words, brethren and sisters, take heed to the warnings. Let us be encouraged by the assurances as we wait in faith for the day of Christ's return. Again, that leads us straight into chapter 4. And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel, only let us be called by thy name, to take away our reproach. Now, what exactly is that verse saying to us? Well, on one level, 
it's the result of war. It leads on from the end of chapter three, doesn't it? The male population is depleted. Thy men, verse, verse 25 of chapter three, thy men shall fall by the sword. And what happens in war? The male population will be depleted and that's leading us into chapter four, verse one. In that day, seven women shall take hold of one man. So that's one level of understanding of these words, but it's the number seven that should arrest our attention. Seven in scripture is a figure of divine completeness. So Isaiah then is pointing out that the men of chapter three, verse 25, could not save them in the day of calamity, but chapter four, verse one, there is one man who can. Seven women shall take hold of this one man, that figure of completeness. One man can save them. And who is this man? He's the man spoken about in the very next verse, chapter 4, verse 2. The man whose name is the branch. And in this figurative language, the nation is then depicted, it's portrayed as returning to worship God. Now, the structure here is beautiful when you think about it this way. So if you think back to the beginning of chapter 2, the, the first of Isaiah's prophetic visions, the chapter begins with a wonderful picture of the kingdom age. God reveals the glory appointed for Judah and Jerusalem in the age to come. Then in chapter 2, verse 5, there is an appeal to the house of Jacob to walk in the light of the Lord. From chapter 2, verse 6, all the way through to chapter 4, verse 1, there is in effect a lengthy parenthesis. You could just put the whole lot in brackets. It's a lengthy parenthesis, as it were, an explanation as to why God would forsake his people for a long time. And then, in chapter 4, verse 2, the prophet returns to the point at which he starts. We're back to a vision of the latter days. Chapter, two, chapter 4, verse 2, through to the end of the chapter. Verse 2 of chapter 4 says, In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. In that day. Now, that expression in itself doesn't necessarily mean the time of the end. The same expression occurs in verse 1 of this chapter, and also back in chapter 3, verse 18, of the prophet's warning of judgment. The expression, that day, refers to the time when God's word, whatever it might be about, is fulfilled. And we have to look at the context to see which day of the Lord is being spoken about. But of course, when we come back into chapter 4, it's very obvious, isn't it? From the context, we can see it has to be the time of Israel's regathering, when her punishment is turned into blessing. The branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. Well, as I've put on the screen there, the term branch is a title of Messiah, as I'm sure we're aware, used a number of times in scripture. Now more than one Hebrew word is used, but the same term that we've got in chapter 4 verse 2, which speaks of the branch being beautiful and glorious, is also found amongst other places in Jeremiah 23 in this beautiful messianic prophecy where Jeremiah says, Behold the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Or again, Zechariah chapter 3, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. And Zechariah speaks about him laying the foundation of the temple. Or Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. 
what lovely passages they are speaking about the work of Messiah, the one who is truly the branch. But just stay with that reference there on the bottom of the screen from Zechariah 6. Do you notice that one of the things Zechariah says about him is that he shall grow up out of his place. Now there's actually a play on words there because that expression, to grow up, literally means to branch up. It's a play on the word branch. It will branch up from under him. It will shoot up. He will branch up out of his place. And as I put in the square brackets there, that expression is best expressed in the words of Isaiah 53, where Isaiah says, For he shall grow up before him, that is his father, as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. Like the desert plant with its moisture-filled roots, it is able to survive in what seem to be unpromising conditions. He grew up before his God as a tender plant. And just think back to the ministry of the Lord and how true that was. Luke tells us that he, he grew, the child grew, and waxed strong in spirit and was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Jesus increased, we're told, in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And then we come to his ministry, and right at the beginning of his ministry, in John chapter 2, he went in and he cleansed the temple. And when the Jews asked him for a sign of his authority, he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And John tells us that he spoke about the temple of his body. And some three years later, the raising up of that temple body completed the process spoken about here, of shooting up out of his place. And it fitted the Lord Jesus to be the temple builder of the age to come. Like his prototype, Melchizedek, Christ is going to be both king and priest. Civil and religious leadership will be combined in his hands. Of course, we know when we think back to the Old Testament that these offices were divided, weren't they? And held by two distinct orders of men. The regal office was hereditary in the family of David and the priestly in the family of Aaron. But when Messiah returns, both kingly and priestly offices are going to be united and their functions will be exercised by one person. Note, this branch shall sit and rule upon his throne and he shall be a priest upon his throne. He shall build the temple of the Lord and that identifies him straight away with the one promised in the Davidic covenant, the one whom David called his Lord in Psalm 110, the king priest of the age to come. He's going to stand at the head of a glorious company of redeemed men and women who will be able to sing in that day, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. King and priest. And there, at the bottom of that quotation, Zechariah says, and the council of peace shall be between them both. In other words, there will be no conflict between the kingly and priestly offices, as there has been so often in the past. But the two will be completely fused together. All mankind will be brought under the subjection of God and will be brought into fellowship with him. So in that little sequence of passages that we've got there on the screen, we have Messiah presented to us as the branch of the Lord, the branch of David, Jeremiah 23, the branch of righteousness. He's also the servant in Zechariah 3, the servant who becomes king priest in Zechariah chapter 6. And he's going to build the temple of the Lord, both the literal and the spiritual temple. Now, as the servant branch, he laid the foundation 
the foundation stone some 2,000 years ago when he triumphed over sin and death. The completion will be seen at his return as king priest branch in beauty and glory. Isaiah speaks about this, doesn't he, in Isaiah 28, when he says of Messiah, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lay in Zion a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. So he's a foundation stone of this great spiritual building which is to be erected. And then there are the words of the 118th Psalm, which Jesus identified with himself. And those words refer to a, the headstone of the corner. The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Just come forward for a moment to 1 Peter chapter 2. Because both of these cornerstones, one at the foot and one at the head of the building, are referred to by Peter in this chapter. When he's thinking about this great spiritual building which is being erected. First of Peter chapter 2. And verse 4. To whom coming, he says, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. So there he, he's basing his figure on the temple. Christ, he says, is a living stone, rejected by men, but actually he's the chief cornerstone, chosen of God and precious. And then in verse 6, he quotes those words of Isaiah 28 about the foundation stone of the building. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. And you go back to Isaiah, it's a foundation stone. A chief cornerstone, the foundation stone, elect precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. And then in verse 7, he picks up the 118th Psalm. The stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. But then more ominously, in verse 8, he picks up the language of Isaiah 8, which speaks of Christ also as a stone of stumbling to those who refuse to believe in him. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offence, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. So Peter, you see, by bringing these stone passages together, shows us that Christ is the foundation, he's the headstone, and also a stone of stumbling to those who refuse to believe on him. But we can be in here as well, brethren and sisters, because he speaks about believers as living stones. They're part of this building. Just have a look at verse 5. Ye also, as lively or living stones, are built up a spiritual house, an holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So we, brethren and sisters, in our lives have to conform to the pattern of the chief cornerstone. We have to build into our lives those characteristics that were seen in the Son of God. And so together we make up a spiritual house. And the process of building this house is going on at the moment. And it won't be completed until Christ returns. We have to offer up, says Peter, spiritual sacrifices. Our sacrifices are not the dead carcasses of animals or the blood of bulls and goats. But we come back to the point about the marketplace. It's a sacrifice of our own self-indulgence, the giving up of our lives in dedication to God. And whether we think about this spiritual house or the temple to be built, how much greater must the joy of the future be when the one who was, who was laid as a foundation stone some 2,000 years ago appears in person, the fullness of God's grace being seen in him, and he's revealed to all as the foundation and headstone of God's building. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And we'll leave our thoughts now on that glorious note, and God willing, we'll return to Isaiah chapter 4 in our study on Thursday. Mm -hmm.